What's up guys and welcome to One Take. I'm Gil and today we're talking about Raised by Wolves, episodes 8 and 9. This video will of course be full of spoilers through episode 9 and there are some big questions. Who or what is growing inside Mother, what is with those cards, and what happens when you eat a necromancer's eye? We'll talk about all that and more in today's breakdown, but first some overall thoughts. I thought there was a lot to love in both of these episodes. There was some pretty intriguing world building around the mythology of the necromancers, the history of the Mithraic, and the mysteries on Kepler-22b. There was also some great character stuff, especially between Sue and Mother, and Mother and Carl. I had a few nitpicks I'll get into in the details, but overall really solid episodes, and I'm hyped to see where we land in next week's finale. Before we get into the details, just a quick reminder, if you're enjoying these videos, please go ahead and hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and hit the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video. You're especially going to want to do that because I've got a couple more Raised by Wolves videos coming out in the next day or two. One will be a deep dive into some theories I have around the cards, and specifically the vision Mother saw in those cards. We'll definitely touch on that in this review, but there's a lot more to go into which I'll do in that video. Without further ado, let's jump into the episodes. First, let's talk talk about Mother and the medbot named Carl. Every android on this show, including Mother, Father, the one we saw back on Earth, and Carl, every android has their own unique voice that strikes this great balance between robotic and a little bit human. Carl here definitely sounds like an artificial intelligence, he sounds like an android, but there's a touch of melancholy in everything he says. Throughout the episode, his blood is being drained, and you can hear him getting weaker and weaker. There's also that great line when Mother is draining the blood from all of the other medbots, where he says, I hope to see my brothers again, but this isn't at all what I had in mind. Again, sounds like a robot, but made my heart sink. He also just has great inflection to every line he says. What are you doing? I'm a doctor, not a blood bag. That's unusual. So I loved Carl, and I can't tell how much of the emotion is actually in his performance and how much I'm projecting onto him, but I think that was part of the brilliance in the delivery of all of his dialogue. So I loved Carl, he was great, and I felt very bad for him when he died. Carl also tells us some pretty interesting stuff about necromancers, saying that they are full of surprises, and the dark photons which power them are a poorly understood technology. He says that the Mithraic built them by following formulas encrypted in scriptures with no real understanding of the underlying concepts. He says that the technology which powers you was a gift from soul passed down from heavens at the dawn of man. I love this revelation. We've been wondering how the Mithraic were able to develop such an intense advanced technology and it seems that it was given to them. Carl says it was given to them by soul. I say it was given to them by the intelligence on Kepler-22b, which might be one and the same. I've also had a feeling that this intelligence could somehow tie into the origins of humanity itself, and that makes me wonder if Carl's mention of the Dawn of Man could be a hint that that's the case. On the other hand, it could just be Mithraic propaganda, like Mother said, where maybe it's mixing fact and fiction. Maybe the technology was handed down to them by the intelligence, but it had nothing to do with the dawn of man. It could just be something that happened in relatively recent human history. We also get the reveal that Mother is pregnant, and we don't get a lot of detail on what exactly is growing inside her, but we do learn that it's partially carbon-based, so it sounds like it's going to be this bizarre hybrid between artificial and biological. Also, when Mother plugs into the sim later, we hear the voice of Simulation Campion tell her, the future of humanity is growing inside you. Now, if you've watched any of my previous reviews, or if you've watched my theory video, then you know that I subscribe to the theory that there is some kind of intelligence living on Kepler-22b. From Simulation Campion's line, the future of humanity is growing inside you, my thought is that whatever Mother gives birth to, the intelligence sees it as the next step in human evolution. Perhaps the intelligence is trying to create the perfect organism, and he thinks this is it, or this is one big step in that direction. That, by the way, would be a theme Ridley Scott has explored in some of his other sci-fi works. By the way, there's some great symbolism at the end of episode 8, where we see the destroyed Ark, and standing in front of it, Mother is holding her abdomen. So, that destroyed Ark represents the death of humanity as we know it, 
and growing inside mother might be the thing which ultimately replaces humanity. This would seem totally at odds with the mission human champions sent mother on back on Earth. He seemed to have a pretty positive view of humanity. He wanted it to continue and thrive on Kepler-22b. So I'm thinking that the intelligence here on Kepler-22b has been able to somehow manipulate events on Earth. That includes handing down necromancer technology to the Mithraic, and it includes manipulating Campion to reprogram Mother and send her on this mission. Ultimately allowing the intelligence to impregnate Mother with the future of whatever is going to replace humanity. This should lead to a pretty interesting conflict because Mother clearly still feels a strong connection to humanity. Between adult Campion, child Campion, Tempest, and the other children, she still cares for humanity, and I wonder if at some point she's going to have to make a choice between the child growing inside her and her human children. Eventually, Tempest catches up with Mother, and as much as I've complained about some of the children feeling a little bit underdeveloped, I don't feel that way about Tempest. In Tempest's case, I fully buy her relationship with Mother, and it was great seeing the two of them finally get reunited here. They find Otho the prisoner in the Ark, and I have to say, when they found the android's head in his backpack, that felt very Ridley Scott to me. I easily could have pictured them finding Michael Fassbender's head in there. Also, Mother asks the android if the helmet allows for blood flow. The android says, of course, which felt a little bit funny to me because I guess that means that the Mithraic have often needed to drain blood from their prisoners. Now, Mother needs the blood here to feed her fetus, but perhaps blood can also work as a general fuel source for necromancers, and that's why the helmets have been built to allow for easy blood flow. When they leave the Ark, Mother tells Tempest she wants to go where the delivery is most likely to be successful. By that, I think she meant, let's head for the caves so I can give birth without the Mithraic finding us. And she would know where to find them because she's been patrolling the planet. On the way there, they see the sun reflecting off some metal, and when they get close, we see that those are the cards which we previously saw in the hooded figure's hideout, under one of those serpent skeletons. Also in this scene, at one point we cut to pretty far away and we hear breathing as though somebody's watching Mother and Tempest. So I've got to assume that's the hooded figure that we know was in possession of those cards. Later we'll get into the vision that Mother had when she looked at those cards, but one question I had in this moment was, did the hooded figure want Mother to find those cards or was he keeping them there and Mother just happened upon them? My guess is that they were clearly left out in the open. The hooded figure probably would have known that the sun would reflect on them and call attention to them. So I think he intentionally left them and wanted Mother to see them. Again, when we talk about the vision later, we'll also talk about why I think the hooded figure would have wanted Mother to find the cards. Now let's talk about Marcus's descent into madness. Travis Fimmel does a great job in these episodes of making some scenes between him and Paul incredibly uncomfortable. Basically, Paul and Sue come up with a plan to run away and ditch Marcus. Marcus starts to get suspicious of this, and that ultimately leads to, like I said, some tense scenes of Marcus questioning Paul and Marcus locking up Sue in one of the silos. Throughout all this, I thought Travis Fimmel did a great job of selling it, but I did find the transformation a tad frustrating mainly because I don't think we have a full grasp on Caleb as a character and what he was like before he became Marcus, so I don't have a full appreciation for the transformation he's made. Also, just because of how drastic a transformation it is, i.e. he's gone from being a non-believer to kind of begrudging acceptance of the voice speaking to him, and now to full-on hardcore faith to the point where he'll turn against his own family. So because it was such a drastic change, to me it feels a little bit more like mind control and less like he's still Caleb, but just has become a believer because of everything he's seen. I find the mind control idea a little bit less interesting, but like I said, Travis Fimmel's doing a great job of selling it, so it's still interesting to watch. Now we do get a couple of tidbits about Caleb. One, there's a flashback to Earth when Marcus and Sue are boarding the Ark, and before they leave, a child atheist explodes, which leads Sue to say, we're traitors. Caleb tells her we're not traitors as long as we have each other's backs. So I interpreted this as further evidence that Sue is much more dedicated to the cause of atheism than Marcus is. We also got a very graphic dream sequence of Marcus cutting off his own face, telling himself that he knows who he really is, 
which to me indicated that Caleb is still in there underneath the Marcus exterior, though outside this hallucination, I'm not seeing much of that, but maybe it's set up for the finale. By the end of these episodes, Marcus has fallen very low, and maybe in that low state, some of his old self, some of the old Caleb, will start to creep back in, and we'll see some of that internal struggle that I'd like to see between Marcus the Believer and Caleb the Atheist. Marcus's breakdown leads him to be somewhat abusive towards Paul and Sue. Holly and Vita are witness to that, and I've said that the last couple of episodes, I found the changing allegiances of the children from the Mithraic to the androids to be a little bit questionable, but I totally bought this being the final straw for Holly and Vita. Because up to this point, they've really only seen mother and father try to protect them, and now Marcus, the essentially leader of the Mithraic, is being a jerk. So at this point, I'm fully on board with the children changing sides and wanting to fully be with mother and father. During all this, Campion has still been locked up in his silo, but with Paul's help, he's able to escape. Now, my brother and I got into a little bit of an argument over how realistic it is that Campion could dig his way out with the monster's claws. So if any of you out there are engineers and have an opinion on how physically possible this would be or how easy it would be, definitely let us know in the comments. Anyway, Campion's able to get out and he burns down the church as a distraction so he can leave. When Campion gets into the woods, Father chases after him, and I gotta say, I loved the cinematography of Father chasing Campion through the woods. To me, the foggy, strange-looking woods added to the feeling that we're heading into uncharted territory here. Earlier in the episode, Sue mentioned to Paul that they've actually seen very little of the planet. She tells him that they should go exploring, we should go on a sort of adventure, which felt a little bit like a plug for season two, and a good reminder that we've seen very little of Kepler-22b, we should all get excited to see new environments and see some new things of this planet. During the chaos, while the church is burning down, Sue, Paul, Holly, and Vita also leave, so Marcus has been abandoned by his wife, his son, and now he also seems to have been abandoned by Saul because he no longer hears his voice. So he's getting more and more frustrated, which eventually leads him to cut off Father's finger, the one that's been twitching for a few episodes. So you've got to feel bad for Father. Luckily, Hunter had already pieced together that Father's twitching finger was actually sending Morse code, the message, Soul is the Light, which turned out to be a password that Hunter was able to use to unlock Father's old personality. Now, in the scene where Hunter reawakened Father, the actor Abu Bakr Salim really shined because before he tells the joke that lets us know Father is back, his face just ever so slightly changes. You see a subtle smile creep up, and just by that subtle facial change, we know Father is back. That was a great triumphant moment. Also, we finally get to see some evidence of Hunter's 205 IQ. And we've got to talk about Father's joke when he first wakes up. He says, an android, a black hole, and a glass of milk walk into a bar. Unfortunately, he doesn't get to the punchline because they're interrupted. Now, I tried to figure out what the punchline could possibly be. I don't really know. All I can come up with is I bet it has something to do with the Milky Way galaxy. Anyway, Father tells Hunter that he needs to get Marcus to take him on the expedition to find the children, and I totally bought that Hunter would go along with Father's directions because similar to the other children, he's seeing the breakdown in the Mithraic. He's also seen how mother and father have gone out of their way to protect the children. Plus, we've seen a few signs that Hunter feels guilty about getting father killed. So I totally bought that transition, and Hunter does get Marcus to bring him on the search for Sue and the children. Marcus brings Hunter and the other Mithraic back to the structure in the desert, hoping to hear the voice of Sol, but he still hears nothing. Then he turns on Hunter, tries to interrogate him. When he gets no information, he sticks Hunter's arm into the structure, expecting to burn it, but Hunter is unscathed. Now, I interpreted this as the intelligence is maybe done with Marcus. It whispered to him, it manipulated him, and it used it for whatever purpose it needed. Maybe it just wanted to get Paul and Sue on Mother's side. And if that's the case, 
Mission accomplished. So it's done with Marcus, but maybe it still has a role that Hunter needs to play, and that's why it chooses to protect him. That night, Hunter and Father are able to steal the lander and leave. After that, the Mithraic really start to turn on Marcus, especially Dorian, the one who was supposed to be on guard when Father and Hunter escape. Dorian speaks out against Marcus, so Marcus slits his throat. Then, good old Lucius finally gets Marcus to admit he's an imposter, and this ends with Lucius bashing Marcus over the head with a rock and shoving Mother's eye into Marcus's mouth. First, I have really hoped that Marcus was right the other episode when he said that there could be other ships coming because if this arc is all that's left of humanity, then they are dropping like flies and I really don't like our odds. Second, sticking the eye in Marcus's mouth was definitely not something I saw coming. So what's going on there? We know very little of the necromancer's nature, but maybe it's known that their eyes are poisonous. It could be a tactic that they used back on Earth when you're backed into a corner. If all you have is a necromancer's eye, you shove it in the enemy's mouth. Now, if it doesn't actually kill him, maybe it'll do something interesting to his mind. We've clearly seen hints that the necromancers can affect your brain. Mother is able to make the children fall asleep. A few episodes ago, they thought Marcus was turning into a ticker, which to me sounded like somebody that gets infected and like a zombie turns into somebody dangerous. So maybe necromancers have a way of infecting your mind and making you dangerous. So if the eye doesn't kill him, I have a feeling he won't fully be himself when he wakes up. And I do think he's going to wake up because it's hard for me to believe that that is it for Marcus. I don't think he's going to die here, but perhaps someone will have to come to his rescue. And pure speculation here, but thinking through who could show up to save Marcus, I wonder if it will be the mysterious hooded figure. The one that was in the hideout, the one who took the cards away when the Mithraic found them. And it seemed to avoid the Mithraic a few episodes ago. Like I said, it showed up, grabbed the cards, and left. But maybe it witnessed all this. It knows that the Mithraic have abandoned Marcus. Plus, Marcus is extremely weak. So at this point, he likely wouldn't see Marcus as a threat. Plus, at this point, I have to think Marcus feels pretty abandoned. He probably doesn't have the highest opinion of soul or the intelligence. I have suspicions that the hooded figure is acting in opposition to the intelligence. And we'll get into why later, but assuming the hooded figure is against the intelligence and now he sees that Marcus might also be, he could see Marcus as a potential ally. So those are the reasons why I think the next episode, we might see the hooded figure show up to the rescue. Let's check back in with Mother and Company. Like I mentioned before, Paul, Sue, Holly, and Vita were able to escape while the church was burning. Later, they meet up with Camping in the Woods and camp out to plan their next move. While they're there, Paul shows Campion the mouse that supposedly Sol returned to him, and Campion points out that the mouse fell down the pit, then returned. So did Tally, but when she came back, she seemed evil. Previously, I've theorized that the intelligence is a supremely advanced AI that essentially transcended its physical form. But hearing them once again call attention to the fact that things only seem to come back after they fall down the pit that makes me want to update the theory. So maybe the AI has basically grown to consume the planet and reside beneath its surface. When Marcus first heard the voices, the structure in the desert gave off heat. And when Paul fell down the pit and Mother saved him, he felt things getting very, very warm. So perhaps Paul felt that rise in temperature because the intelligence gives off heat, or maybe its intense processing power causes the planet to warm. In any case, it seems like living things, if they fall down the pit, the intelligence gets access to them. Though I definitely still have some questions because the mouse seems to have a physical biological presence while the manifestation of Tally seems to be more ghost-like. Later at the Ark, Holly finds an artifact from Earth. And my ears definitely perked up there because I'm very intrigued to get any details on Earth's history and what got us to this point. In this case, she found the Tooth of Romulus. 
and Romulus is the legendary founder of Rome. Mithraism was one of the religions practiced in Rome before Christianity took over, so this sort of ties things to our timeline. And there's also the myth of Romulus and his twin brother Remus, who were partially raised by a she-wolf, which sounds familiar. Now, it's been unclear to me so far whether this show uses our timeline and just branches off into a possible future, or if it's using an entirely alternate history. Finding this tooth and tying things into ancient Rome suggests to me that it is using our timeline, and it further suggests that Mithraism somehow had a resurgence on Earth in recent human history in this show, and I'm guessing that the intelligence had something to do with that. Then, Sue and the children finally reunite with Tempest and Mother by following a trail of blood, and when Sue draws a gun on Mother, all the children surround her to protect her. Once everybody's reunited, a few interesting Interesting things happen. First, Sue goes out of her way to help Mother, going so far as to transfuse some of her own blood. I thought they played this whole sequence really well. I felt like I understood Sue deciding to ultimately aid Mother, even though she was hesitant at first. First, she saw the children trusting Mother, so that gave her a little bit of reason to give her a chance. Second, I think both of them bonded over the fact that they're both raising children that aren't biologically theirs. And finally, Mother agrees to keep Sue's secret that Sue isn't really Sue and she isn't really Paul's mother. So I think Mother agreeing to keep that secret helps build a little bit of trust with Sue. I also want to point out the moment where Mother tells Sue, I understand that sometimes we must lie to spare the feelings of humans. When she says that, she looks at Campion, so I think in that moment, she's thinking about the embryos. So I think Campion taught her that lesson. Sometimes lying protects a human's feelings. Now we have to talk about that insane vision Mother had. She picks up the metal cards that were left by the hooded figure, then looks closely at the one which seems to show two larger figures surrounded by five smaller ones. She looks closely at it and seems to sort of unencrypt it, and that unlocks this vision she has. To me, the vision looked like a bunch of hooded figures, essentially worshipping the birth of some kind of a mechanical being. Now, in the last episode, we learned that the designs for necromancers were taken from encrypted Mithraic scriptures. So I assume that's what these cards are. They seem to have Mithraic symbols on them, and they unlocked this memory. So I think Mother is seeing a piece of history, something that maybe took place on this planet a long time ago. Now, why would the hooded figure leave these out for her to find? Perhaps it doesn't have the technology to read the cards itself. It can't unencrypt them, but it knew that Mother could. So maybe it left them out so she would find them. Maybe in the next episode, the hooded figure will approach her and try to get her to share with him what she was able to see. Now, I could spend this entire review talking about what Mother saw in that vision and what it all means. I do have a lot of thoughts on that, so like I mentioned at the top of the review, I will be posting a video later today, deep diving into all that. I'll put the card here so you can click right to it. The headline is that I think it has something to do with the birth of the intelligence itself. So check out that video to hear more detail. Mother's woken up from this vision when the prisoner reverses the blood flow, and we find out that if you take necromancer blood and inject it into yourself, it gives you superpowers. Now, honestly, I found that to be a little bit cheesy. It kind of reminded me of Bane from Batman and Robin. Not that it looked bad, but just the concept of taking this liquid in and it blows you up to be super strong felt a little bit cheesy, but it was pretty satisfying when Tempest threw the android head away and we got to see Otho's head get crushed by that bucket. I'm also assuming that they showed us this so we would know it's a possibility. So we know in the future, another character might take in Necromancer blood and similarly soup up. We also get the reunion of mother and father. It was great to see them together again. Also, mother asks father, is this a memory? That confusion to me is further evidence that what we saw from that card was a historical event. So she lived in a memory for a few minutes, seeing the birth of whatever that thing was. And after living in a memory, now she's not sure if she's back in the present or still experiencing some kind of a memory. Going back to those cards, Paul hears a voice, and we can't make out exactly what the voice is saying. At least, I couldn't make it out. But anyway, after Paul hears the voice, he picks up those metal cards and then burns them all. To me, that says the intelligence does not want Mother 
or anyone else accessing the information on those cards. So that makes me think the hooded figure might be working in opposition to the intelligence. The intelligence doesn't want anyone seeing those cards, but it seems like the hooded figure does, so that's what makes me think the two are opposed to each other. And that's why earlier I was thinking that the hooded figure might want to team up with Marcus. After burning the cards, Paul decides to let Campion in on a little secret. Paul tells Campion that Soul is the one who put the baby in mother, and the baby is going to change everything. How does Paul know this? He says he can just feel it. So I think no real surprise for us there. We already heard from Simulation Campion that the baby is what's next for humanity. So when I hear Paul say the baby is going to change everything, that's right in line with the idea that it's going to be some kind of an advanced life form created by the intelligence. Anyway, I think we can wrap it up there. A lot of really intriguing developments in these episodes, and we know they're not going to wrap everything up in episode 10 because there are more seasons coming, but I'm very curious to see how they decide to leave things off at the end of next week's finale. Anyway, let me know in the comments what you thought of these episodes. Did you enjoy them as much as I did? What are your theories about where we're heading next? Put it in the comments and we'll keep the conversation going. With that, one more quick reminder, if you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and hit the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video, and you'll get notified when we put out the theory videos I mentioned earlier. With that, thanks for watching and see you on the next One Take.